So the graph is a picture. We have the equation, when we look at the graph, the graph is a picture. A picture of what? The, the, the points. <laughs> okay, we got points, lines, equations, words got thrown out there. That's good. Okay, but when we say points and lines, like we're just kind of restating that this thing is a picture, right? The fact that we're using points and lines or curves or whatever is that it is a picture. But it does, you know, it has a relationship, or it should, and it shouldn't be a magical, mysterious relationship between the graph and the equation. What is that link? Abby, did you have anything? It's wrong. It's wrong? <laughs> yeah. What if it turns out to be right? But I know it's wrong. <laughs> How do you know? Okay. Just say it. Just say it. Okay, Michael, he's got something. Isn't it just like the outputs of the equation? Okay, the outputs, and, and importantly, the outputs paired with the inputs, right? So that's exactly what it is. And there's, there's not much more to say about it. Um, we can use different words, but we're going to be saying the same thing as Michael just said. It's the inputs and outputs of whatever that equation is. Okay? If it's a linear equation, we're going to get a line as our picture of the inputs and outputs, or uh, what we'll more often call solutions. Okay? But that's what a solution is. It's just a, it's a set of input-output that when you put that input and that output into the equation, whatever the equation is, it comes out to be solved, to be true. All right? And that's what a graph is. It's a picture. Well, the inputs and outputs, those input-output pairs we call solutions because when you plug them into the equation, they work. They make a true equation. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Um, so, yes? Question? Right. Okay, so keeping that in mind, that a graph is a picture of all the solutions. It's just uh, any point on the graph. The graph is not the xy coordinates, but it's the actual shape that you draw. Okay, any point on there will be a solution to the equation. It'll solve it. It'll make it true, whatever the equation is. Okay. With lines, we had a few different ways of representing them. We could represent them any number of ridiculous ways that we want to. Okay, but we talked about uh, point-slope form, slope-intercept form, standard form, all these different ways that we can uh, write the equation of a line. And we talked about how to find all of the, uh, the important points or, or some important points, the minimum number of important points to draw a line. We found out the, the easiest ways, given the, the way the equation is written, to find two points to draw a line. Okay? And the idea is the same with parabolas. We want to find the minimum number of points that at least gives us a good idea of, of how this parabola is uh, shaped. Okay? We know in general the parabolas are shaped like a U, but we want to know is it facing upside down or, or uh, right side up? Is it, is it uh, steep? Is it not very steep? Is it up here, is it down there, is it to the left, to the right, that kind of stuff, okay? So depending on the form that it's written in, uh, we find those points in different ways, all right? Um, so first let's run through the vertex form really quickly again, okay? So that looks like uh, a times x minus h squared plus that's what vertex form looks like. All right. But before we just throw that out there and start saying that K does this and H does this and A does that and all that kind of stuff. Um, back up. Okay. So if we say f of x equals, or y equals, right? the output is equal to this thing over here. Find the output by doing this. If we just say x squared, and we were to graph the solutions to that equation, those are pretty simple, right? Uh, one squared is one, so we get input one, output one. Input two, output four, because two squared is four. Input three, output nine. Input three, output nine. Three squared is nine. Input zero, output zero. Out input negative one, output one, because if you square negative one, you're gonna get a positive one. Uh, input negative two, output four. Input negative three, output nine, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so this doesn't have this steady uh, up and over stepwise uh, motion that a, that a line would have. Okay. For every step over, we move up more and more and more. It keeps growing faster and faster and faster. We go up to 16, and then we go up to 49, and we go up to uh, 64, and 
one, and it would just keep going up faster and faster and faster. So it would not be the steady line shape. <clears throat> right, so there's our basic parabola. Then we talked about what if we add three, or what if we subtract five, or what if we do that kind of thing, right? So we went through, through painstaking uh, explanation to, to remind you that all this function is doing is the same as this function, but it's, it's adding three to the output. Right? Adding three to the output. And we remind ourselves that we represent output on the graph vertically. Right? Output is represented either by positive outputs up here or negative outputs down here. And if we add three to all these outputs, okay, we take this output of one, we add three. One, two, three. That goes up to four. We take this and add three, we get up to seven. We add three to this, we get up to 12. All these points move up three because we're adding three to every output, and output is represented vertically. And so we get this vertical shift. The same exact shape, but it moves up three. That's the effect that it has on the picture of the solutions. It moves up three. And then if we uh, multiply by two after that, well, it would still be adding three to, the, uh, to all the outputs, um, but now the outputs are twice as big as the outputs for just x squared, right? Uh, x squared goes one, one. Two x squared goes one, one times two, which goes to two. And instead of two, four, we go two, okay, square two, you get four. Multiply that by two, you get eight. Go to three, square three, you get nine. Multiply that by two, you get 18. Right, so we're getting those. And then again, remember, we're adding three to each of those. Okay. So you put in one, you square it, you get uh, one. You multiply that by two, you get two. You add three, you get up to five. Uh, one, two, three, yeah, that's five right there. Uh, here we get uh, three. Uh, what is this going to be? 8, and then add 3, get to 11. And 11, and the way there. So we're going to get this shape, and then we'll get an identical reflection on the other side, because they're symmetrical. Okay. So we talked about all that. We did several, several iterations of this of an experiment, and we came up with the vertex form. Okay. So the vertex, where will we find the vertex if we're in vertex form, given these numbers get plugged in? Yeah? Isn't it like you go over H and uh, up here? Exactly. We'll find it at whatever. H is, that'll be the x value of the vertex. Whatever k is, that'll be the y value of the vertex. And after we've found the vertex, then, then H and k have like, done their job. They've moved the, the parabola over and up, or left and down, or whatever the values of H and k are. Okay. And then A will change its steepness. It'll make it that much steeper. Okay. So if it's twice as steep, then all the values will be twice as high as they were compared to x squared, or if they're three times, it'd be three times as steep, four, four times as steep, and so on. Or a half, half as steep, okay? So it changes the steepness, and if A is negative, if A is negative, then what? Yeah. Flip it. Flips it upside down, yeah. Upside down. So we get up, up and down, right, depending on if k is positive or negative. If h is uh, is positive, meaning we're subtracting a positive number, it moves it to the right. If we're subtracting a negative number, which means we're adding, it will move to the left. Okay. So up and down, left and right, steep or you know steeper or less steep, and maybe upside down if a is negative. So. If we were to graph something in vertex form, which is, I think, the easiest of all the forms, and all the information's right there, move it up, move it down, left or right, and you're halfway there. So 
It's already written as x minus h, right? It's important that this be a minus sign right here. If it weren't, if it were a plus sign, we could write it as minus or negative 2. But it's already done. It's minus 2. So the vertex is at negative 2, comma, or sorry, not negative 2, but positive 2, comma, 4. Right, so I can find the vertex easily. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. The vertex is right there. That's where we'll see that they come down and go back up or up and back down, depending on if it's right side up or upside down. Uh, well, the negative tells us that it will be upside down, and the 4 tells us that it's 4 times uh, as steep as just a regular old x squared. Okay? Regular x squared would go over 1 uh, and down 1, over 2, down 4, over 3, down 9, over 4, down 16, over 5, down 25. You get the idea, right? It's just a number and the square of that number. Okay? But now it's not just a number, and then the square of that number, it's a number, and the square of that number times 4. So over 1, and not down 1, but over 1 and down, and multiply that by 4. That'll bring us all the way down to here. Over 2, and not down uh, 4, but 4 times bigger than that. So down 16. So there's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. Over 2 away from the vertex, and down 16. Okay, And those points, along with remembering that there's this this line of symmetry right through the middle, we can reflect it over there. There's symmetry uh, across that line of symmetry coming down here. Now we can definitely draw a good parabola. Not a perfect one, right? It's going to be flawed. It's not going to be exactly right. These points in between, it's not going to be quite, you know, exactly spot on. But it is a good problem. It is a good parabola, just not a perfect one. But it gives us an idea of what kinds of solutions we're going to get for this, uh, for this function, what kind of outputs it's going to have. Um, right? It's not going to have any bigger, anything bigger than 4. Right? We can't get any outputs up here. It comes up here and stops at 4 goes back down. Um, it's, going to, it's going to go into the negative rather quickly. Right? We're multiplying those squares are already big numbers, and we multiply by 4. That's going to be also quite large, okay? not much bigger. Found the vertex, it's upside down because that, that number out in front is negative, right? It's making all these values that would be positive when you square them, it would be positive numbers, making them all negative, so they're all going down. And then four makes every output four times bigger. Okay, so there's our vertex form real quickly again. Um, so just to, to reiterate what I said before, the, the idea is to get uh, at a few points, a few key points, uh, as easily as possible. Right? With the vertex form, we're, we're noticing that if we uh, take x squared and we add a number, or we subtract a number, it's moving up and down. If we subtract or add a number to x before we square, it's moving left and right. If we multiply that quantity by uh, a scalar or a, a number, a constant, then uh, it's going to make it steeper or less steep. Okay. Um, then, if we were to see it written this way, uh, minus three. Okay. Well, this is quadratic. Okay. What's a quadratic equation, by the way, or a quadratic function? How do we know it's quadratic and not, say, linear or something else? What makes it quadratic? What do all these equations have in common? Look at the equation, say, in 4.1. Okay, the ones in 4.1 are, are in what's called standard form. Okay. If you look at all of them, what's the one thing they all have in common? X squared. What's that? X squared. x squared, right? Not just x to the first, right? There's that x squared as well. And then there's that x cubed. x cubed's not in there, x to the fourth, whatever. The highest power of x is 2, x squared. Well, this is quadratic. If we were to write it out like that, uh, just standard, standard form, 
Uh, the highest power of x would be 2. You have an x squared there, nothing bigger. No bigger power of x. Just as a, I guess, as, as an aside, how would we write it in standard form? How would we rewrite it so it's a standard form and we kind of look at it and confirm, hey, that is a quadratic? Okay, foil it. Did we talk about foiling in this class? <coughs> how I feel about it? No. Okay, here's how I feel about it. I don't like it. Okay, and here's, here's the only reason is uh, because the, the word foil is it can be helpful for a while to help you remember first, outside, inside, last, right? Um, but if you stick to that like it was, that was it, that was the whole truth, then you're, first of all, you're, you're missing what's going on exactly here. We're just using the distributive property a couple of times. Um, and if you were to use first, outside, inside, last on something like this, making this up completely out of nowhere here. But if we just did first inside, outside, last, or first outside, inside, last, well, here's the first ones, and here's the outside ones, and here's the inside ones, and here's the last ones. We'll notice 3x didn't get multiplied by anything. Okay. And I don't bring this up for nothing, because it definitely happens. So if we just stick with this, we're going to miss the important fact that all we're doing here, we're multiplying x minus 3 by x plus 5. If we were to multiply x minus 3 by 2, how do we do that? How do you multiply x minus 3 by 2? Distribute. Just distribute. You just distribute. 2 times x, 2 times negative 3. 2x minus 6. Okay? This is no different. Just distributing. But we're not distributing a 2, we're distributing a different number, we're distributing this number to there and to there. So if I distribute x plus 5 to x, just like we got 2 times x, we're going to get x plus 5 times x. And over here, just like we got minus 6, we're not going to get minus 6, we're going to get minus x plus 5 times 3. Does that make sense? See what I did there? Just distributed that big set of parentheses to each thing, just like we distributed the 2 to each thing in the parentheses. Does that make sense? Okay. And then to multiply these together, we just distribute the x into the parentheses. x squared plus 5x okay. minus this parentheses, 3x plus 15, so x squared, 5x minus 3x is 2x, 5x, well, it doesn't have anything to combine with, we just have a minus 15 there. And what we see here by distributing the x plus 5, it just, it just takes everything in this parentheses and multiplies it by everything in this parentheses. So FOIL makes sure that that happens if there's only two things in each parenthesis. That makes sure that everything in one parenthesis gets multiplied by everything in the other parenthesis. And that idea keeps going on through any two parentheses that I can multiply together. This times that, and by that, and by that. Okay, X just got distributed through everything. Two then gets distributed to everything. So if I had my way, I would completely erase FOIL from every textbook everywhere. Okay? Because we try to skip over these things, like the fact that we're using the distributive property on something that looks a little bit tricky, uh, and then we wind up memorizing something that we have to unmemorize later because it doesn't keep on working forever. So that's my little thing, my little preachy thing about uh, FOIL. And so I won't, I won't be using the word FOIL, uh, I'll be saying distribute, you can distribute everything. So if we were to distribute uh, these two parentheses together, we get x squared plus 2x minus 15. 
And we can see it's a it's a quadratic. So it's a reverted in standard form and then we're trying to figure out how do we find some points that would make it easier to plot them on the, on the graph, uh, and then draw a picture, draw a picture of our parabola, the solutions to this equation. So to do that, it turns out it's, it's not any easier to write it in standard form. It's easier to leave it in what's, what we refer to now as intercept form, because in this form, it's very easy to find the x-intercepts. I know we talked about this one. What is an x-intercept? How do you define an x-intercept? Yeah? When y is zero. Very good. When y is zero, right? That, that is a, a very specific mathematical definition of what an x-intercept is. When we're on the x-axis, that's where y is equal to zero. Okay? Remember, this is, this is y, right? This is the output. We're going to put a number in for x. Put a number in for x and get zero. We want to get zero. Okay. Now the reason we choose to do this, the reason we, why to, we, we make y equal to zero is because it's actually very easy to find a couple of numbers that cause this to happen, right, since it's written in this form. Seeing as it's written as a number times a number, that uh, what's, what's one number that will cause this whole thing to be zero? Zero. Zero, zero. let's see. Oh, no, three. Zero plus five times zero minus three is five times negative three. So we just hit okay, negative 15. So that, that doesn't happen. What did you say, Carl? Three. Why three? Because of the multiplying. Right. Because putting three in here, We'll cause this to be zero, and whatever this is, it won't matter because we're going to multiply it by zero, which makes the whole thing zero, for sure. Right? So three plus five, that's eight. Eight times zero is zero. So three, if we plug three in for x, plug three in for x, we'll get zero. Zero times anything is zero. So at x is 3, y is 0. What's another number that will cause this to be 0? Negative 5. Negative 5. Negative 5. Also, x is negative 5 will make y equal to 0. So now we found two points where, the, where x causes y to be 0, or on the graph, uh, we're on the x-axis. That's useful. If we had one or two more points, we could definitely sketch out an idea of what this graph is supposed to look like. We just found an easy way to find two points by finding the two intercepts, and now we want to find an easiest way to find some other points. Okay? It would be a pretty easy point to find. Pretty like uh, important point to find. Yeah, vertex. vertex, right? It's like one of the few points on the graph that actually has its own name. Right? All the other ones are just points. Maybe you get a y-intercept or an x-intercept, but uh, after that, we run out of names, special names. Where? What's the x value that will find the vertex? What x value will the vertex be, like above the? Zero? Minus one. Why minus one? Uh, the line of symmetry is going to go right to the vertex, right? Yeah. Of course. Right? The vertex is like right there in the middle of the parabola, cutting it right in half. Right? Well, if it does go right in half, if it is a line of symmetry, then and, and we have a mirror image on one side or the other on the line of symmetry, how do we know that that line has to go through negative one? Middle of what? Two points. two points we already know exist on the graph. Okay. 
that line of symmetry should go right through there. If you're not convinced, we're trying to find the middle of two numbers, the average of two numbers. We just take 3 and negative 5 and add them together and divide by 2, right? Just the average of negative 5 and 3. So we get negative 2 divided by 2, that's negative 1. So we know the vertex is somewhere here, but where is it exactly? Is it up here? Is it down there? That's the fastest way to find out. Put some more numbers in the side. Which numbers? Random numbers? Random numbers? I want to know where the vertex is, right? Yeah. yeah. Zero? Zero wouldn't be bad. Zero would tell us where the, where the graph exists at zero. But if we are still trying to find the vertex, the vertex is going to be right here, where x is negative 1. Right? x is negative 1 right there. You just take negative 1, put it in there. Negative 1 plus 5 is 4, times negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4, negative 16. All the way down here, let's call this negative 16. Way down there. So the, the vertex form, the intercept form, these are 4.2. All right, so you guys have any questions from 4.2? That, uh, this stuff, Abby? Um, 15 and 16. 15 and 16. Uh, Valley, we're going to go down 15. They're really similar, so we'll just go with 15. Oh, we just have a few forms here that exist for us. We got standard form, intercept form, and vertex form. Um, and notice. The convenient way that we've, we've written this equation is, is a number times a number times a number. Right? It's just a, just the product of three numbers. What, you know, you can easily make this into uh, this product, this product of three numbers, into a, a specific answer. Like what answer, what, what output would be easy to get here? You don't even have to think about it that hard. If we multiply things together, one of those numbers is, multiply three numbers together, one of those numbers is what? X squared. X squared plus plus mm -hmm. well, The easiest product to find zero. is when you multiply by zero, right? Yeah. If you multiply by zero, what do you get? Zero. Right? One's easy too, but the answer could be different, right? Five times one is five, that's pretty easy, but Multiply by zero, right. the answer is always the same, zero, right? Zero product property. If you multiply two numbers together and get zero, you must have used a zero to multiply by. It's the only way it can happen. Um, so making this product to come out to be, the output to be zero, is a really easy thing to do right here, right? It's a really easy thing to do. What, what numbers will cause this to multiply together and be zero? Two. two? <laughs> What? Negative, negative, two. Two. negative two, right? Negative two plus two will give us zero, and we don't even have to worry about the rest of it. Because the rest of it is going to be a number times that zero times another number, and we just multiply all that together. If you multiply by zero, you get zero. So x is negative two, or x is, what else? Negative six. Negative six will get a zero. Those are some really easy input outputs to get. Negative 2 going into this function will give you 0. Negative 6 going into this function will give you 0. There's one. There's another one. Now there's any number of ways we could have, instead of doing what we just did, we, we could have found some points. We could have just plugged in numbers 
and you know, said this goes in and this comes out, this goes in and this comes out, and start plotting some points. By doing it this way, finding these two points uh, is, is the easiest thing to do for one thing, I would say. And also, it gives us two specific points that are directly across from each other, across each other, uh, across from each other over the line of symmetry. They're a reflection of each other over the line of symmetry. We know the line of symmetry goes right through the middle. Negative six plus negative two over two. That's negative uh, eight over two. And that gives us negative four. Negative four is where the line of symmetry goes through. We just had that vertex. If it was up here, if it was down here, right here, right there, whatever, then we could draw a pretty good sketch of this graph. So how do we find that vertex? How do we find out the y value of that vertex? Ready? Put in a number. For Which number? Zero. Oh, negative four. Negative four. That's where we know the x value of the vertex is. And if you want to know the y value, if you have an x and you want to know the y, and you have a function that turns x's into y's, why don't you give it an x and it'll tell you the y. Okay, so uh, negative four, so three times negative four plus two times negative four plus six. That's three times negative two times two. So that's uh, negative four times three, negative 12. There's negative 12 right there. And we'll connect these points as symmetrically as possible. Pretty good. It's, it's not going to get a whole lot better than knowing those three points and connecting them with the shape we know a quadratic has. It has a parabolic shape. So if it, uh, 16 would be very similar. We're just going to find those x-intercepts. We're going to split it right down the middle, find that line of symmetry, point that x value in, find the vertex, uh, the vertex's coordinates, uh, the x and the y. Now we have those three points. We can connect them, and there you go. Away you go. How about uh, another one from 4.2 that might have been giving you some, some gap? Any gap? 4.2? Okay. Well, those two forms, vertex and intercept, I think are nice and convenient. Right. And to me, they make a lot of sense. I know exactly where those points are coming from. I know my x-intercepts are coming from making the whole thing into zero, right? Making y be zero, forcing y to be zero. Uh, the vertex form, I, you know, I went through all these steps and I, I, I noticed these patterns, like adding five moves it up five, or subtracting three inside the fences moves it to the right three, those kinds of things. So I utilized my observation of those patterns. Um, but in 4.1, we have this thing called standard form. And it, it is pretty standard. Because if we were to multiply everything out and combine like terms and all that kind of stuff, that's exactly what it would come out to look like. So it'll come out to look just like that. So in this case, where the where the points come from is not as clear. With intercept form, it's clear. Because I got a number times a number. Hey, that's easy to make one of those numbers zero and for the whole thing to be zero. A vertex form, that makes sense. I, I remember these patterns of shifting up and left and right and, and getting steeper or less steep. That makes sense. Okay. This, though, is more like I give information to you that is not as intuitive. It does not make as much sense as the others. And that is that for the vertex, x is negative b over 2a. Okay. We, we could go about proving that, right? We could start with that knowledge that, that that is the x value of the vertex. I could prove it to you, but it kind of all started with the fact that that is what it is, that the x value of the vertex is negative b over 2a. Um, and to, to just come up with that, it's not as intuitive as, the, as say, the vertex point or the intercept point. Um, there it is. Like a little formula for finding the x value of the vertex. Okay, so 4.1, there's homework problems. 
with you by night. Um, and I'll like 23. Y equals 4x squared plus 8x. Thing to keep in mind, no matter how we write this, no matter what order we write these, these values in, this guy with x squared is always a, this guy with x is always b, c is always, always the constant. Okay. So here, what's b? Eight. b is positive 8. Right? There it is right there with x, multiplied by x is positive 8. And a is? 4. Is negative four. Negative four. Alright, so the x value of the vertex is negative b over two a. That's negative eight over negative eight. That's positive one. So the x value of the vertex is one. That means if I were to look at the graph, at the x value of positive one. I would know somewhere here, which means also that the line of symmetry goes right through there. Somewhere there, we'll find the vertex, yes? Why did you put b as negative 8? I didn't put b as negative 8, I put negative b as negative 8. Oh. It's, neg it's the opposite of b over 2a. Okay? Especially important when b is negative, is then negative, negative makes positive. That's probably the most common mistake that happens. Right, so the x value of the vertex is one. I know the vertex is somewhere here, right, on this vertical line. How do I figure out what the y value of the vertex is? What's the x value? How do I figure out what the y value is? Okay, that's exactly what this function does. That's what every function that we'll ever work with does. It takes x's and turns them into y's, or use different letters, but it still takes input, turns it into output. So we go in here, 1 and 1. So negative 4 times 1, that's negative 4, plus 8 times 1, that's 8. So negative 4 plus 8, that's 4. Add 2, that's 6. Yeah, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's our vertex. 1 count of 6. We found the 1 by ne doing negative b over 2a. We found the 6 by just plugging 1 into the equation to figure out what y would be. After that, we just need to find some points. Okay? A couple more points would do, just like when we had intercept form, we had the two intercepts in the vertex, gave us a good enough idea of, of the shape of this graph. And we'll do the same for this. Um, so just need like two more points. What would be a really easy point to find? And how and need a point. We just need an x and a y. We just need an input and an output. Any ideas? Zero. What do you mean by zero? You're saying put into zero, put into zero. Put into x. Yeah. Put into x. That is a pretty good idea, right? Because because zero times negative four is zero plus well another zero plus two. Two zero zero flat. So that turns out to be pretty easy. So put in zero, you get out two. And the convenient shape of a parabola being symmetrical. This is one away from the line of symmetry, so one on the other direction. We've got to have the same y value. It's got to be a, a mirror image. There we go. Enough information to draw a decent graph. That's all we need. Okay. Questions about something you saw in 4.1? Something difficult? No? Everything's good? Everything's peachy? Okay, minimum and maximum values. Um, so, I've said this before that the. What if, 
function, what makes a function unique, makes a function different from other functions, is its value. And by value, we mean the y value. Right? What makes a function unique is the output that it has. All functions take in pretty much the same inputs. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's what it does with those inputs that makes it different from other functions. Okay? So that's when we say the value of the function, we mean what does it produce? What does it put out? What is its output? All right. So when we say the value of the function, we're talking about output. So what's the, you know, look at this function right here. You can see by the graph. Does it have a maximum value or a minimum value? Maximum. Maximum. There's a biggest value that this function can output. Right? And it won't get any bigger than that ever, no matter whatever you put into the function. Only this largest number will come out. What is the maximum value of Six. this function? Six is the maximum value. So this has a max of six at, let's say, at x equals uh, one. Okay. And if the parabola was the other way, right, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's only a, uh, a limit to how small it can get, right, then it would have a minimum down there at the very bottom where the, the vertex is at the bottom of it rather than the top. And this guy. This guy has a minimum value, a minimum value of negative 12, if I remember right. This one has a, a minimum value, a minimum value at negative 16, right? Y is negative 16 when X is negative 1. Right, this guy has a maximum value at 4. Maximum value at 4. So where are we always going to find the minimum or the maximum value? The vertex. At the vertex, right? The vertex is that very special point. It has its own name. And that vertex is always going to be at the minimum or the maximum value. That help, Misty? Is that clear enough? Okay. Anything else? Just, just want to work on your homework and watch the numbers.